What's up, coordination? How you doing? On the pod today, we got Tim Dobbinschutz, who is a pluralistic freelancer and engineer seeking tough challenges, a blogger that has been writing about things like soulbound tokens, quadratic voting, harbinger taxes. Why has he been writing about those mechanisms? Well, Tim shares the goal that we have on the Green Pill podcast of creating a more pluralistic, regenerative ecosystem in Web3. And so we talk a lot about the mechanisms that he's written about on his blog and also how those could be used in order to create a more regenerative world. So Tim is just kind of one of these like deep technical thinkers that sees into the future of the technology and is able to transport back some of the ideas about the mechanisms into design criteria that helps the rest of us understand where this more regenerative Web3 movement is going or uh, in a lot of the episode, we talk about the privacy implications of doing soulbound tokens and of building these things and the ways in which there there are trade-offs that we really need to carefully navigate here. So I think that Tim's just really thoughtful, really technical and articulate. And that's why I was excited to have him on the pod. His blog, he's, he's posting like one really thoughtful post per month here. And we're only able to go into three or four of his blog posts, but really would encourage you to check out his ball out excuse me, his blog, in addition to uh, this podcast episode. So without further ado, I'll give you Tim Dobb. I hope you enjoy. Working in Web3 is awesome. It's freeing, powerful, and so much fun. But working outside of the typical W2 employee structure is a deal breaker for so many. Opolis is helping the self-sovereign worker focus on what they do best, their work, while managing the back end for them. There is a lot of nation state overhead when working in Web3, and Opolis takes care of all of the backend stuff, freeing you up to do what you do best. Opolis leverages group buying power through a community employment co-op, helping you save 20 to 50% on high quality, affordable healthcare options through Cigna. So do what you love and maintain your financial security. With Opolis, you must be authorized to work in the United States to receive Opolis benefits, but Opolis is expanding its services to Canada starting on January 1st, 2023. So book a 30- minute consultation with the Opolis experts and join Opolis by December 31st of 2022 and get a thousand work tokens and a thousand bank tokens when you sign up. So go to connect.opolis.co slash bankless to get started. Goldfinch is a decentralized credit protocol with a mission to connect the world's capital to the world's growth. Goldfinch focuses on real yields from real companies. So start lending your USDC to real businesses driving growth worldwide. Goldfinch's borrowers are proven fintechs and credit funds in emerging markets who need access to Goldfinch's capital to drive economic growth in regions faced with barriers to financial access. In just under two years, Goldfinch has loaned over 100 million USDC, reaching over a million people and businesses across 28 countries. Goldfinch is doing what DeFi was always meant to do, expanding financial access to those who have historically been shut out of the TradFi system. So become a Goldfinch member to put your USDC to work, empowering real businesses growth. Join Goldfinch's new member vaults to be an active investor and take part in supporting Goldfinch's security and expansion. Receive yield enhancements generated by protocol revenue, plus access exclusive communication channels and more. So go to goldfinch.finance to get started. Hey Tim, how's it going? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Really glad to have you. I know that we've been planning this episode for a while. So I wanted to get into identity and quadratic voting and soulbound tokens, uh, harbinger taxes with you. Um, where should we start? Uh, I see that you wrote this post about the user experience problems of quadratic voting. Yeah, yeah, that that might be a, a good starting point. Um, yeah, we, I guess we can start from there. I, I think. Uh, I'm working on like a bunch of topics that that all seem to be related to each other, and sometimes mm -hmm. even for me it's a bit difficult to find like the the, the common denominator or the thread. But that that might yeah. start, might might be good at. Yeah, I work that way also. It's it's nice to work across a bunch of subject matters, and then when you have that breadth first view, you can kind of combine things from different domains. And being a connector allows you to kind of see the whole playing field and see through the fog of war. But uh, yeah, maybe let's start with the the thread of quadratic voting and the user experience problems there. You want to tell us about that post? Yeah, yeah. So um, es essentially, all of that starts with uh, a, a client that I've been working with, and and so I'm a basically I'm a freelancer, uh, and I was contacted by this um, yeah like quite renowned artist um, from Germany called Hito Steil, mm -hmm. and. Um, and we wanted to do a, a project together. And then it, it turned out that uh, 
like through some, you know, like we, we didn't really like know in the beginning, like what we really wanted to do. And so we were like mm -hmm. thinking of kind of like different projects that we wanted to do. I think one was like a more like a more of a game and it had to do with like property titles and so on. But eventually they ended up uh, registering the, uh, the ENS domain name of uh, the, the Bundeskunsthalle mm -hmm. in, in Germany, which is a, a, a German federally funded uh art exhibition hall and so through that like all of a sudden there was uh, like a conversation started around this idea of what minting an ens name really means and and the powers that it gives you and mm -hmm. uh and, and like by collaborating also with the like with the curators of the bundeskunsthalle then uh basically they they were like yeah but that's actually interesting that you are now owning this ens domain and so you know maybe given that you you have that and that you are going on strike kind of were mm -hmm. uh you, you know maybe we can we can have like a governance uh vote on you know what what should be the future of the the german mm -hmm. uh bundeskunsthalle and so mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of how this entire thing um ended up like like started essentially and and what Great. uh what eventually happened is that we had a like a, a recording in in um, in a TV sh studio where we had uh, three different governance proposals similar to how you would do it on uh, snapshot.org uh, mm -hmm. nowadays with like a with a DAO uh, we had mm -hmm. that uh, we had these three proposals being like um, you know presented by by three different parties there is the there was the uh, department of decentralization that is organizing uh, mm -hmm. east berlin then there was um, someone from other internet, uh, which is kind of like mm -hmm. this arts and technology research uh, group. Right. And then I think the last uh, party was uh, the, the the like institutional like the institution itself, Bundeskunsthalle. Uh, and I think it, I, I think it it must have been their like president or or CEO or whatever mm -hmm. um, that was also making a proposal. And after having uh, you know. After after everyone making their proposal on stage, and we had this also, uh, you know, live streamed on the internet through YouTube, um, the audience had the choice or had the chance of um, doing a quadratic vote on the on the proposals that they they liked most, and and that's kind of where where I, I was involved the entire in uh, in the entire project where um, I basically I was developing this uh, quadratic voting application. Mm -hmm. And can, um, can we just back up for a second talk about why yeah. quadratic voting? So quadratic voting is is known to be a way of doing voting where you can express not only your preferences, but the direction and the intensity of your preferences. And basically the way it works is you get a certain amount of voting credits and then you can spend one voting credit to get one vote. You can spend uh, I think it's four voting credits to get two votes. You can spend 16 voting credits to get four votes. So the amount of votes you get is the um, is the square of or sorry the the square root of of the voting credits that you spend on that particular issue and so i could vote uh i want to vote four votes for option a which cost me 16 voting credits one vote against option b and one vote against option c and in total i've used 18 voting credits so it allows you to you look at the intensity and the directionality of your preferences um i hope i got that right but why did you all choose quadratic voting in this instance yeah yeah i think it was uh, I, I mean, I don't know the 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 entire reasons, but I, I think it was it was for 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 that reason to, uh, you you know, I think I I mean I can't speak for Hito Steyl, uh, my myself, but I think the the idea was that uh, we we had read about this concept of quadratic voting, and uh, you know she's uh, she's like uh, es essentially like working also on like crit critiquing a, a lot of like what happens in the world and in the arts art world and so on. And so uh, I, I think a, you know, a theor theoretical critique on how uh, Glenn, Glenn Whale, you know, outlined this idea of quadratic voting in the book where, you know, we would have come together, created this, uh, this, you know, like this paper that basically, you know, go, goes against whatever is said in the radical markets book felt mm like it didn't feel right and so i think the, the it was basically an attempt at you know critiquing the concept by 
mm. you know, doing what an entrepreneur would do. And so essentially by, you know, building it, testing it, and, and then coming back to the drawing board and be, you know, being like, okay, th you know, this, these are the things that we have learned and, and, uh, and, and these, you know, these are the things that worked and that didn't. Um, yeah. And so I think on, on that end, I think we, um, uh, it was very interesting because it ended up leading to, yeah, to this uh, blog post that you, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Got it. And so, um, I see from the post that there was, there is, you know, several conceptual user experience problems that you ran into during the implementation would be, would be fun to unfurl those. I'm not sure how many of the audience with has done a quadratic vote.co but or a, a quadratic vote before, but you could do one at quadraticvote.co if you're looking to do a very easy quadratic vote. And maybe some of these these years user experience issues or some some things that we can talk through. So you want to you want to take us through this? Yeah, sure. So I I think I mean I want to I, I think I want to talk about kind of I guess like where I also was challenged as the developer here. I think the the this. Mainly to point out in the beginning, I think that this is a like quadratic voting is a thing that we as a community have very little experience with. Also in terms of you know just how how are we building like user interfaces? How are we you know laying uh, like out, out, outlaying this um, yeah the interface itself? How you know what what is the mental model that we uh, need to you know te teach people on, on how all of these things work? And I think. If I had to summarize the entire blog post, then I think that that's the gist of it is that it's, you know, you are basically you are exposing people to this very new kind of idea of uh, voting. And then it's also mathematical. And, um, and, and that's, I think, like one of the biggest challenges now in with, with regards to like the uh, to like the individual challenges that we ended up uh, running into this, there's, there's a couple of them. And I basically in this blog post, I list them all like one by one, uh, I, I can maybe go like briefly through each of them and, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and we can maybe like dive in deeper on, on like things that, that you're also interested. Right. I think, yeah. And, and, and I'll just say why I'm interested in this, um, mm -hmm. is that we're trying to create a more regenerative world with higher resolution democracy that leverages collective intelligence. And I think that there's a certain like economist eye view that designs these mechanisms and thinks about how they're perfectly rational sort of on paper, but then you put them in front of actual humans, which are predictably irrational and are really guided by the user interface. And it's really important that we close the gap between these perceptual problems and the mechanistic things that are in the design. So I just want to say that out loud before we go into these things. Yeah, totally, totally. I, th I think that's a really, like, that's a really important point. And I think it, it also kind of touches on the, on the first problem that I outlined and that maybe I'm not even hundred percent capable of, uh, of reproducing, but I think in the, in the radical markets book itself, the, uh, the, the, the idea of quadratic voting is basically derived from this I idea of, uh, you know, the categorical imperative, um, where, you know, you say basically that a, a person's freedom, um, you know, is limited by, you know, where they are intersect, like in, um, uh, but are basically starting to limit a, another person's freedom, right? So, like, mm -hmm. dur I think, dur for example, like, I think during COVID and you know, with mask wearing, I think this uh, this started to have like a, a practical relevancy, where you know, if you were a uh, you know a, a fit young person, then you know, for you potentially the the virus was like less fatal than let's say for an older person. But uh, you know, that that should like in the categorical imperative that morally still doesn't give you really the the, the like right to not wear mask because you know mask wearing also means you are protecting the other person and so if basically if if you know as a let's say as a young fit person i stop wearing masks and i end up you know infecting other people then you know my my freedom is suddenly limiting the freedom of other people where where for example we are like uh you know uh, you know where i'm like becoming uh, where i'm uh, coming to in close proximity to like a more vulnerable person or something like this. And so I think mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the radical markets book, uh, understands the categorical imperative. And it's very interesting actually that then, you know, the, what they're basically saying is that, you know, we, we can also codify this, uh, this moral, this moral thing into math. And so the, the idea here is where, 
you know, you have this uh, this town, and um, you, you you know, there's a um, a electricity plant, and it's producing energy, but it's also polluting the air. Where the mm. air is the public is the public good, and then mm. the the book kind of uh, the book walks us through this this trade off between you know people on one side needing uh, cheap energy, but also they c- they cannot really have like the entire air being polluted, and and additionally you know some some people might say that um, you you know air, air pollution is fine if I get uh, cheap energy, and and other people might say the inverse, and so and and the 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 book outlines this example of Niels, where uh, where Niels essentially uh, I, I think cannot cannot have that much air pollution because Niels is running a um, is running a laundry, um, and so I guess that's because he needs to uh, hang the the clothes up up in the end. So if the air is polluted, then I guess the clothes are smelly afterwards or something like this. And and so and so kind of given this categorical imperative of um, of, of, you know, like, uh, you know, this, uh, symmetry of everyone, uh, you know, uh, having kind of this, the same say in, in this, uh, in, in the, in the public good, uh, of, of air quality. I think they, they basically derive this ma- math of saying that, you know, if Niels wants to impose certain qualities on other people, uh, that live in the town, then you know Niels should pay the quadratic cost of that because basically Niels is like influencing you know Niels is not causing a, a cost to uh, you know to to himself only by for example increasing the electricity price but it's basically increasing a, a cost to everyone that lives in the town because he might have like a, a very divergent uh, 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 view on how things should work and so and and so basically they have like this. They have like a graph. I think you can see it in page one hundred. I have it here, like one hundred and three of the Princeton Princeton Press uh, edition. And it, it, and so I found that very interesting. And I mean, it makes t- to me it also economically makes a lot of sense actually. This and I, I you know I, I think at um, at a Shelling Point in Bogota, uh, probably you were also there. I think mm-hmm. uh, there was uh, uh, some someone speaking on the plurality stage. Now I forgot the name, but. Basically, what they said is something like, "Yeah, that that, that anyways, like that that this is like be, you know, it's beautiful that we can express basically this uh, categorical mm-hmm. imperative of math and so on." But I think on the uh, on the other on the other hand, and and this is what I was trying to point out with my blog post is that this social cost for voting is, I mean, it's really hard to to describe. I think I. I I tried it here, uh, and and I'm not sure like how 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 well I'm making myself understood. But then also mm-hmm. I think it it pre like it, it assumes essentially also somewhat of like a a very like high density information environment where mm-hmm. everything can be boiled down into like costs. So like you know for mm-hmm. Niels that is running a laundry, yeah. I think makes really a lot of sense to you know to like make this trade off between smelly clothes and and you know maybe. Um, <laughs> the the laundry electricity costing less and so on right yeah yeah so and, it sort of presumes education or a very simple problem to solve i think yeah but it i think it's also it also kind of suffers from looking at the looking at the problem uh, very deliberately only in an economic model and for, because for example i mean you know in the in the case of um you know, pricing again like this uh, the pr- the production cost of clean clothes in a laundry. I think it's easy to kind of get an overview over that, right? But you might mm-hmm. have also people, and this goes back to what you said in the beginning, where mm-hmm. the, uh, the maybe you cannot put a price on, for example, what what, what uh, is the value of of clean air? Like, for example, when mm-hmm. somebody is uh, spiritually uh, opposed to that, I think this. Um, this way of pricing things becomes uh, um, just much more complicated. Or if someone, for example, uh, you know, um, has like a undiagnosed um, lung condition, and then so so then you know they never end up like uh, you know paying for this uh, externality that if they knew they had a, a, a like a lung a lung condition that uh, you know can get worse with air pollution, then they would also pay more. So I think while I mean it's not really um, it's not really a strong critique against um, 
against a quadratic voting per se, because these things can also happen with like regular voting. I think it points kind of to this um, to this uh, uh, flaw of 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 thinking everything in in the economic terms and and like in this like closed loop mm -hmm. system and, and so on. Um, right. Yeah. Other. Well, I'd love. I, yeah. I would love to like I know that we're going deep on the quadratic voting uh, paper right now, but I, I think like in order to respect the breadth first nature of this episode, I'd love to take a little sample of the Harbinger tax stuff and then a sample of the Soul Bound yeah. token stuff. And then we can get into a little bit more of a discussion uh, towards the end of those. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah sounds good. Cool. Uh, where should we go next? Harbinger taxes, Soul Bound tokens or something else? Yeah, we can go to Harbinger taxes. Okay, got it. Um, so how would you explain harbinger taxes? Just want to respect that not everyone in the audience knows exactly what those are, why they're important and how they work. Yeah. So uh, harbinger taxes are essentially a, they, they, they are a, a policy mechanism that allows you to create a type of property that we, that we're not familiar with necessarily. We have, I think, private property mm -hmm. that is, is based on private property law. So, you know, like people cannot uh, take takes uh, things from you once you acquire them. You don't you know don't need to like um, you know be around uh, them. With, you know, like uh, you you don't need to occupy like a, a private property, right? It's it's always mm -hmm. belongs to you whether whether you are there or not, and these right. kind of things. And then public public goods are uh, kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum where mm -hmm. they they really don't belong to anyone necessarily but uh, but also we have to basically they, they then suffer like from 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 different kinds of problems as uh, as uh, private uh, private property and Harburger taxes are somewhat in the middle between those uh, those two things so you know where on on one side you have uh, maybe a uh, an apartment in an inner city that is the private property and on the other side you have something like uh, city's air quality then uh, a, a property that is a, a harburger property so to say or i think nowadays we also say it's like a partial common ownership um that sits right in the middle between those two things so um mm -hmm. the, i think the yeah where it's interesting is that it has basically different economies compared to private and public goods mm -hmm. and um yeah that's i think for me as a someone that is like implementing um yeah all sorts of different uh me mechanisms to solve uh to solve yeah. problems in the crypto space it's very interesting the, the blog post that you have here says harbinger taxes can be crypto's sustainable business model which i mm -hmm. love that you're just taking the shot at something that big and important um do you mind yeah. if i take a swing at explaining harbinger taxes go for it Cool. So I think that they're understood as partial common ownership. And the idea here is that if you have private property, then basically there's a tax levied against that private property every year. And, you know, this is something that if you own a house, you're familiar with homeowners tax. But with Harbinger taxes, you're actually able to set the valuation of your private property and then you pay taxes at that rate. But there is a catch, and that's that if you set the valuation too low, then anyone can buy your private property at any moment and purchase it from you. So there's a natural equilibrium between the incentive to set the price low and therefore get less taxes and to set the price, um, get less taxes, um, but you also might get your property sniped from you and set it high, whereas you pay more taxes, but there's less of a chance that someone will take it off the market for you. From you, so that's that's sort of how I understand mechanistically harbinger taxes to work. But I'm curious to unfurl with you: how can that become crypto's sustainable business model? Are we going to like issue NFTs to each other, and then there'll be harbinger taxes on on those 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 NFTs? Like, how can I fund public goods with harbinger taxes? Yeah, I think uh, why I wrote this blog post. The story the story is that I, I had a, a a project, and then. Uh, I had it funded through through grants funding and and so on, and uh, I got kind of like pushed into launching a token. You know, people were mm. like, "Yeah, now you know, now it's the time to like launch a token and so on." Yeah. And uh, for me, that always felt a bit like reckless. I you, I think you also had a tweet where you said, uh, the, "You know, the I think cost of deploying an ERC twenty is like twenty dollars, <laughs> but lo legal costs are like two hundred thousand or whatever, right?" Yeah. So that. That's familiar. that 
that that just felt like so reckless to me like that or like also it felt like it doesn't just didn't feel right somehow and so mm -hmm. basically i i said to myself you know with, with this project i was like okay maybe i mean i don't want to take all of this like unknown unknown legal risk and so on and like launch a token and mm -hmm. i also have like lots of other posts that talk about like how i think you know tokens are not addressing certain things that i i want like I don't know, we can go in, into that later, but essentially like I was in this, uh, basically I, I limited my uh, solution space and I said, okay, if I cannot do tokens and we're like in crypto and you know, there's like this bull market, which is when this uh, post was written and I was like, mm -hmm. what else can I do actually to make money? Like, you know, besides like raising a token and the, I mean, the problem is also, you know, if you, you know, if you, if it's like some people in in the protocols they put like fees into the smart contracts right and and so there's this idea that you know with, with like a fee basically that then you you know you you create revenue for your uh you know development company uh you know if you put that into the the protocol code but um mm -hmm. um you know and, and it's all good and well but the the, the, the i think the, the dynamic of the space is that it's a it's usually a race to the bottom where you know uniswap was uh, you know the first automated market maker and then there were like these 10 different clones where you know mm -hmm. each one of them ex like just was able to basically remove like su such a thing like a fee structure where where someone can can monopolize and and extract value uh, 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 from from the code itself so so for me that sounded all of a sudden like we we will never be able to charge any fees for developing uh, you know, like solidity code. And that, that mm -hmm. seemed kind of, I, I was like, I was like, this is like really difficult to work with. Right. And I also don't want to launch a token. And, and I think with being exposed to hardware architects is what's interesting, uh, about them and why I say they are a, a sustainable business model is that for one, and th I am saying this as not being a lawyer, right. But like they are, mm -hmm. I think they are not securities in this or like equity in the same way that tokens mm -hmm. are. They are more like a fee mechanism in your in your solidity contract. And then secondly, if you are able to create a um, a market, for example, where you're like issuing an NFT or whatever that ends up working with Harburger Texas, then the then a like a copycat uh, project that wants to you know like fork your code and potentially like remove you know the the things where you can uh, you know fund your fund the, the protocol development. In, in the case where you price uh, your property with Harbor Texas, the, they cannot do it because essentially Harbor Texas are this like new universe of property right. uh, of, of properties where the, the taxation itself is not only a means to, uh, you know, to extract value from, from the, the operator of the market. Mm -hmm. The Harbor Texas are there to enable a like positive externality right so mm -hmm. exactly how you explained it in uh you know in the in the case where people are able uh to monopolize property in 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 the private property area so like for example right. inner city apartments and stuff like this right where you know you you're like the sole owner of that specific um apartment and you're like you know you, you're not even influencing basically the price of that apartment like the people that are you know, opening coffee shops around your neighborhood, they, they are actually mm -hmm. like influencing the price and so on. In, I think in, in that world, actually the Harburger tax add positive externality because they make it so that you cannot monopolize on this like unique position that you're in. And so you always have to like um, basically act in like a possession. I think Matt Previtt, uh, from uh, radical Marx called it's like possessional yep. interest kind of way where you're always yeah. trying to like utilize the the property that you own um, mm -hmm. essentially like uh, as much as you can and so the so really the conclusion I think of that blog post is that if we can find pro like digital properties that we can um, that we can create these uh, harbor tax markets then I also think given that there is this like tax that is going to some so to someone, Mm -hmm. uh, it's sustainable because it cannot be forked out compared to just like a, you know, like a, a fee that sends money right. to the protocol developers, because if you fork it out, then you are also losing the property of, you know, harbor taxation and like this, um, much better uh, mechanism for pricing. Right. 
And I just want to like add to this, like the moral basis for the tax. Um, I know there's a lot of libertarians out there that are anti-tax. And um, uh, I just want to say that from talking to Matthew Pruitt, who's one of the sort of authors and primary thinkers on Harvard's tax, the main idea between partial common ownership is that when you're utilizing a property, you're um, utilizing the public goods that are around the property. So the, in the example of a house, if you're close to a park, then um, your house appreciates in value because of the proximity to the park and you're utilizing the public goods that are around the park, the roads to get there, the transportation networks that come to your house, the post office, um, the park, the downtown, all require upkeep. And, and so by having that private property, you're actually participating in the network effects of the public goods around you growing. Um, and the digital equivalent of this is, say you have an ERC-721 or an ERC-20, and you're issuing a harbor tax on those, then basically the idea is that... Um, is that you're relying on open source software, on Geth, on Prismatic, on the consensus and execution clients, on the ecosystem of IPFS that surrounds your token. And to the extent that your token is appreciating and really pumping, it's due to the public goods that your, your token is built upon. So I just want to make sure that we articulate the moral case for why Harbinger taxes make sense from the perspective of, of Math Pruitt. And, you know, we can get into, you know, the debates about whether taxes are good, um, good or not. But uh, that's basically the basis for why Harbinger taxes are supposed to basically create a synthesis between public goods, which are hard to fund, but really important and private goods, which are easier to fund, and but also important. Yeah, I, I also think that maybe the the uh, the name Harburger Tax is not yeah not very approachable. That's probably <laughs> like I, I think you could develop something like a Harburger Tax uh, software by just calling it a, a fee or whatever, and you wouldn't even have. I think the in general, I think the concept is applicable. Where you know it could be that maybe one day you are like playing a video game that implements <clears throat> Harburger Taxing through. Mm -hmm kind of like fee mechanism you wouldn't even know i think you just would try like you would un try it. at one point i think you would start to understand the dynamics of like how this thing works and um, mm. yeah the world has woken up to refi and cello is here for it cello is the layer one for the regenerative finance movement it's fast planet positive and built for the real world cello has committed to producing a sustainable future from day one and has built its technology around one of the lowest carbon impact consensus mechanisms and is the world's first carbon negative evm compatible layer one blockchain Cello is a movement to create the conditions of prosperity for everyone, whether it's tokenizing carbon credits with Toucan, providing capital to underserved communities with Unicorn, or building for millions of users around the globe. Cello was created to transform crypto enthusiasts into a movement of change makers. Follow along on Twitter at Cello.org to learn more about how Cello is accelerating refi for a positive, lasting impact on people, communities, and the planet. And if you're a builder interested in refi, be sure to join the Build with Cello hackathon live now with a prize pool of over $100,000. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive, single-chain treasury management to expressive, flexible, and multi-chain treasury features, such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. Great. Well, we're about halfway through our time together. Maybe we should move on to Soulbound tokens and uh, we can grasp the whole elephant before I ask you, how can we use yeah. all these mechanisms to fund public goods, to create a regenerative commons, stuff like that. But let's go deep on Soulbound tokens next. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's the perfect segue between uh, how Burger Tax and Soulbound tokens. I think the... It, like... Vitalik, I think, posted the, the um, posted the blog post called uh, Soulbound around January, and then I I got really inspired by that. I was also reading at the same time like this uh, book by Glenn Whale on 
radical markets and so on. And, and I ended up going to uh, Eve Denver. I also saw you speak on stage and so on. And I think mm. it actually was you that was mentioning uh, this idea of non-skeuomorphic property. And it really hit me. It was like, yeah, we don't necessarily need to build in the digital realm something that is either you know a public good or a private good. We can also build like something complete wildly non skeuomorphic in the sense that mm. we'll, you know it's not imitating anything that you know already exists like uh, like like for example and for like just to understand like skeuomorphism is this idea that yeah you you basically you're building like this yeah almost like a visual bridge between something that exists and something new so like for example mm -hmm. I think the the iPhone's uh, notes app was always looking like it had like textures as as backgrounds that were similar yeah. to paper. And then it also looked like you were like really scribbling. And so that was like a classical skeuomorphic uh, application compared to, I think, nowadays sure. notes, I think, is like more non-skeuomorphic, like tries to like understand, like tries to experiment with yeah. the, with like what was possible in digital. And let, so let me just give me my, my rundown on skeuomorphism is like the old resembles yeah. the new. So like my favorite mm -hmm. example of this is uh, Yahoo and Google both had the goal of uh, organizing the world's information, but Yahoo, Yahoo took the card catalog system and put it on the internet. So you had to like browse a directory in order to find your information. Whereas, Yah whereas with Google, I could just type in a search term and, and find that information. And so by enabling the primitives of the new to create new things, non skeuomorphic things, then we're actually able to build more powerful software systems. So that's just while we're getting into skeuomorphism, I just want to make sure that the audience had two definitions for it. Um, but but please continue. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so like, I think during shelling point, it must have been or Eve then I think anyways, it hit me it was like, this is so interesting, you know, that we are now talking about soul bound property, essentially, where mm -hmm. this is somewhat of a like, you know, I, I like as a World of Warcraft player, uh, ex World of Warcraft player myself, I was like, the, you know, because you so basically a soul, a soul bound icon and a soul bound item in, in World of Warcraft was one that you would uh, obtain from, let's say, slaying a dragon with like a 40 person uh, a raid. And, you know, you had like to do all of this preparation and everything. And then in the end, I think there was like a mechanism to allocate the the item, items that the, the dragon uh, uh, dropped. And then I think the, the idea really was that, you know, you don't want to enable this uh, pay, to, pay to win kind of uh, system where someone slays a dragon with 40 people and, you know, gets this super cool uh, sword mm -hmm. as, a, as a loot and, and then sells it on an auction house for like 1,000 gold. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like this person that was never in, in that raid, like did the, all this like social... Uh, uh, social and coordinational work to to you know help slay the dragon can just like buy that sword on the auction house and like show it basically you know equip it and and show like oh look I I, I slay slayed the dragon or whatever so I think like so so basically soulbound tokens was is like soulbound items was really a way to to prevent it where you make uh, items essentially non finance like non financial in a way that people cannot put like a numerical price on on the item itself and so i found that fascinating because i i was like this is genuinely something i've never seen in the real world and and with talking to people uh at, at if denver but also talking about like harburger taxes and harburger property i saw somewhat like of a i saw like a similar problem where mm -hmm. you know um where if if you have a a harburger a, a Harburger property, then they are also, then also it starts to, um, you, you need to build like a differentiation between, you know, who is the, the actual owner of the Harburger property and who is uh, just a, a possessor, let's say, right? And so mm -hmm. you, I think conceptually you can think of this where, you know, ownership is like this set of all the rights that are given, given to you over like an object. And then you know, from this like bucket of rights, you can basically pick, uh, you know, more individual items. Like you can say, you know, there's a right of me, you know, being able to use an object or there's a right of me being able to destroy an object or to, you know, lend it out to someone. Um, and, and so, and so I think like soulbound tokens at the time and, and Harburger property had this sweet spot where, Fundamentally, the Harburger property should should not be transferable ever from the owner, but mm -hmm. only the 
the usership should be able to change. And so basically I was, I don't know, I was like really diving, very, I think, very deep into like this rea realm and I was writing all of these blog posts about it. And I ended up concluding that it must be where, you know, uh, when, when I'm able to specify how a soul bond token looks like, then I'm also able to build a, a Harburger tax property, which I, I, I think today maybe I'm, I'm not that much of a believer um, in, in that anymore, but it anyways led me to, uh, to, to build a soul bond tokens. And, and maybe just to give you a rundown of what soul bond tokens are, so... Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you ask 10 people, you probably get 10 answers. But I think the most, uh, the most uh, pro prominent answer is probably that of whatever is written in the uh, Decentralized Society paper. So um, essentially, they, they are, they're almost like a, a way of encoding um, claims uh, into, in, mm -hmm. into a data structure and then you know, signing these claims and, and publishing them uh, selectively. Um, I also think, but I also think you can frame Solvon tokens as kind of this, uh, yeah, like a different kind of property class. So then they don't necessarily have to be, uh, to be claims. Um, I, and then I think the, maybe the more, the most, uh, tangible, uh, framing for developers at least is one where you say, you know, a Solvon token, the most simple Solvon token is just a non-transferable token. So like an mm -hmm. NFT, for example, where, Uh, you can, you know, once it like it, it, it's um, uh, sent to your account, you can essentially um, you can essentially never never send it back. And uh, I think the name the name then uh, uh, start, starts to originate a bit more from uh, this idea of uh, you know like soul binding something to to you, where similar to how how it works in World of Warcraft, you are. Um, mm -hmm. You're giving something to a certain account, and the the intention is that there is that, that there cannot be a, a financial uh, a price attached to it because it's fundamentally non tradable uh, with, with at least the the usual uh, uh, ways we we trade uh, things on right. in Web three. I will link the Soulbound paper in the show notes right here so that people can read it. But basically, uh, the Soulbound token, the paper is called Decentralized Society. And it's all about what if there's this deep interconnected web of attestations. You know, Kevin attests that Tim is a great podcast guest. And you attest out that uh, other authors in the Ethereum ecosystem have done important things and so on and so forth. And you create this sort of web of trust. Uh, of of these this directional attestation graph, and I almost think of it as like PageRank, where websites that link to each other are kind of voting for each other's legitimacy. When you send soulbound tokens with attached metadata, you're making vouches about each other. And the sum of this, the gestalt of all these things, is we have reputation that we can begin to I don't know solve civil resistance or provide under collateralized loan using the densely networked part of the information. And that becomes really exciting to me because once we have the network effects of this spinning where more people are getting soulbound tokens or other identity markers, it could be DIDs, could be things that are off chain, then more people will try to consume those DIDs because they're getting more utility out of them. So that's what's really exciting to me about decentralized society. And I feel like soulbound tokens are just a means to that end. Um, and there's some maybe some trouble, pri troublesome privacy things with only going all in on Soulbound tokens. Um, but, but that's what's exciting to me about Soulbound tokens. I'm curious what about that resonates with you. Yeah, yeah, I think you touched on, a, I think, one of the most uh, fundamental points of the uh, concept when you mentioned privacy and that, um, that, that this is like such a, I think, uh, such a challenge, such a challenge to That, that still like needs proper addressing in the entire um, in the entire concept where uh, I think people in general are very overwhelmed with the idea of uh, sending and storing data on blockchains and you know I think the norm so far has been that you know we, we voluntarily upload data uh, to the internet and so, there's like a good chance that somehow you can always delete that data by just following through, uh, you know, we, like you look at the domain name and you find out who's responsible for hosting that server and then you 
I don't know, there's like a legal recourse that you can do and whatever. So you always end up being taking, like being able to take down stuff, right? I think in, in the EU where, where I live, there's even a, a, like the right to be forgotten, which, which is essentially like a, a right you can use as an individual to remove like, uh, ne negative, um, Uh, like claims about you from, for example, like the Google search results and stuff like this. And I think uh, with with blockchains, and this is not, I think this is not specific to Solvon tokens, but it's it's generally true for for a blockchain that keeps all the data available permanently. Is that um, that people are now kind of finding out by when we're talking about attested uh, claims, they're like damn, this can have like actual really bad implications too, where like, how, how am I able to, you know, remove a, a piece of information that I, I might not want to have um, uh, uh, on chain. And so, and so I think it's useful in this case um, to think of privacy as uh, contextual integrity. And I'm, I'm not really making this up. Uh, this is a, like a, a research mm. paper from uh, Helen Nissenbaum, which is, I think, Quite renowned in the space, where basically the I, I, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna slaughter I think the the concept, but I'm I'm anyways gonna say it like here uh, quickly, which is where the contextual integrity in in a in in a context in a situation is that mm -hmm. where the uh, information disclosure actually um, uh, has like an interactive uh, com component with what you're trying to achieve. So let's say if I go to the doctor. Um, and I tell the doctor that my uh, foot is hurting, then I'm sharing this information in the, in the context and with the integrity assumption that, you know, the doctor will use this information that my foot is hurting to treat the foot and that I end up not having a, a hurting foot. Now, I think there's, there's like, like two things where, where these uh, uh, things can go wrong. One is when the, this information then, uh, you know, starts leaking outside. So for example, if the, doctor then tells, uh, you know, their partner that I ended up having a, uh, a, a hurting foot, right? Then, the, then I think the, the contextual integrity of, you know, why I told that doctor that my foot was hurting is broken. And then uh, the, the other uh, dimension is where the doctor would use uh, that information for like a different uh, cause than just, uh, 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 you know, like treating the, the illness of my foot that we call. Mm -hmm. So like, We basically call that uh, the appropriateness, and so, so I think viewing privacy as contextual integrity is very useful because, as, at least as an engineer, it allows us to make like uh, like pretty straightforward judgments on you know things that we sh we should do and we shouldn't do in terms of implementation. And I think with uh, the, the now the challenging part, I think with soulbound tokens or anyways being exposed to this idea that. Uh, there might be, uh, you know, cases where we, where things are never reversible, where once we publish them, they, they will permanently be out there because the blockchain yeah. keeps them around. <clears throat> This becomes challenging because it's something that we've never had to deal with, I think, before. And so, and so, like, for example, like, I personally, with being a, an EIP author, like, I'm, a, at least for now, I, I think I would, like, push back, for example, on Vitalik's idea of this, Uh, uh, neg negative reputation uh, red registry. Even if you can make it, uh, you know, I, I think like there. I think like how Vitalik frames it is almost like in a in a utopic case where you know all of this mm -hmm. zero knowledge math and so on works out perfectly. And I think in that in that scenario, I think uh, uh, you know the the suggestion of negative reputation is actually not a bad one. But I think that in order to get there. I think it will take much longer than we we uh, that that we probably have time to actually figure out the the the, the privacy implications. And so, like being you know um, the EIP author of these things, I, I I don't see myself confronted with the technical intricacies of zero knowledge proofs. For me, it's more a challenge of like telling people, hey, you know, be a, please be aware of not putting like sensitive information on chain, and um, you know. Like try everything possible to not, uh, yeah, le leak like met like metadata and, and stuff like this. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely some problematic things there, and you know, this isn't like a Web two app where if we make a mistake, we can just roll it back, and so it, it bears a lot of 
the need to be judicious as we move forward on these things. Um, you know, and I'm curious, we only have, we only have about five minutes left uh, of the things that we've discussed. What are you excited about when it comes to funding the commons or creating non skeuomorphic applications with blockchains that you think are really compelling? I mean, you've kind of got this breadth of the design space. What are you really excited about? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a, not an easy point to make, but I think I'm the most bullish, I think in general on the blockchain space I am because, because essentially it's a, it's, it's almost like a sandbox environment where we are experimenting with, where we are experimenting with mechanism design and with economics. And, you know, now we have even like this, almost like these research and development uh, labs, like, uh, like, like, you know, a radical exchange and, uh, the uh, um, what's the other one commons stack and so on that you know they are like producing this new type of mechanism design so it's like a mix it's it's not only academic research anymore that publishes books uh, books and papers but we're also implementing these things right in in like uh, real scenarios with real money and we're like we're basically finding out if these things work so I think I'm I'm really optimistic in the sense that we can test some of these new mechanisms out and we can we can innovate and we can we can uh, find data in in yeah like just in the sandbox environment and then still uh, we can apply them to the real world eventually and i think one of the uh, one of the examples that i i would like to make here is is that of the uh, energy grid in germany right now that is mm -hmm. under heavy pressure from the you know, uh, from from the Russian government that stopped um, the uh, the gas uh, e exports via the Nord Stream pipelines, where you know uh, you need to hold a certain uh, voltage within the the grid, right? And therefore, the pricing of uh, the utility providers of the electricity actually is by whoever uh, provides the the, uh, the highest mm. price per uh, kilowatt kilowatt hour it's it sounds a bit yeah. unintuitive but given that you always need to hold the the, the voltage of the of the grid that's that, that what you have to have to do and so fascinatingly we have a uh, a, a mayor in, in the south of germany that uh, you know their uh, community has heavily invested in renewable energies and he he goes on television uh, talk shows and he says, you know, we're making a killing with our uh, wind and solar energy because the price of solar and wind, I mean, we, we have invested in these, uh, yeah. you know, in these like windmills and so on, but we're not paying mm -hmm. more like everyone else is paying more by producing uh, electri electricity with gas. And so I think this points to, to a problem where this uh, uh, en energy mix that we're, we're having in, in, uh, Germany, that although it's uh, you know it's um, it's diversified, uh, we we'll, we we'll we always have to pay the highest uh, the highest production price. Um, is kind of, it like puts it, it uh, puts us into this absurd position where you know the the, the people that uh, that 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 produce green green energy make make basically the most amount of money, even though they're not really contributing the most uh, significant amount uh, into the grid. And so, and now how do I get back to this uh, with blockchain? I think the uh, block production mechanism in Ethereum is actually very similar to that of uh, the energy grid, where uh, similar to how in the energy grid we have to keep the voltage at all costs, because otherwise it means we would get a blackout. Also in Ethereum, uh, in the Ethereum consensus algorithm, we also have to continuously come up with new blocks so essentially, we are also having a similar problem where uh, those that supply the block production have a, a really a lot of power in, you know, uh, uh, adjusting, like making the prices adjust and making them skyrocket. And so with, uh, I think, I think uh, with EIP 1559, uh, we uh, now we are, for example, experimenting with a mechanism that I think went from all the way from the engineering to like, I think people in the in the economic space, you know, review, reviewing this proposal and so on, into like an implementation, and we and now suddenly we can see that you know we went from a a like a pricing mechanism for block storage that was that had like a very variable um, uh, uh, rate of pricing over time, 
up to like a, a algorithm that ends up being not variable at all, but in terms of spikes is uh, always course correcting to the mean, because basically as soon as we go over the uh, normal demand, instead of encouraging actually um, more supply through, uh, through increasing the price, we're actually saying we're burning the, uh, we're, we're burning the ETH that is excess um, that, that we get from um, that we get from demand. And so I think while these two things, maybe they are like, maybe, you know, it's like two different problems I'm talking about. I think the, in, in the end, like the, the ec economic primitive, I think I have pointed out that they are, that these two things are very similar. And what makes me excited is that essentially we have tested out a thing that uh, with EIP 15, uh, 59, you know, we, we have tested out a thing in like this sandbox environment where, you know, everyone mm -hmm. that, he had like opted into Ethereum, uh, you know, was, was part of it. But also, you know, if it hadn't worked out, then potentially I think the consequences would have been yeah. uh, less fatal than, for example, if we had tested this out like on the scale of a country where like the energy, where we're yeah. like testing this on our live energy grid. So I think it mm. makes me like incredibly bullish that basically we have this giant sandbox where we can test economic, um, economic policy and then once we get the, the clean data and so on, we can also apply this to much more critical uh, in infrastructure. And, you know, this ends up, uh, I mean, hopefully this ends up creating a, a better and more regenerative uh, financial system, but also a world of uh, like regenerative world. Yeah. The way I think of it is like first do no harm. So like we got to stop the scams and the Ponzi's and the rugs, create mechanisms that uh where those people can be held accountable or at least you know not get the attention that they're sucking up all the oxygen in the room uh the carbon neutrality has there's been a lot of steps forward with that with the merge and now it's about building regenerative systems that are net positive and so what are the mechanisms for that um we only have a few more minutes is there anything i didn't ask you that that you want to say um i'm not sure we talked about a lot of things um I'm happy to be here and uh, to be talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is honestly the highest use of my talents in network is to try to figure this stuff out together. So appreciate you coming on to talk about the work that you've been doing. Really encourage listeners to check out your blog, which uh, I've got a link to in the show notes. It's uh, Tim Dobb dot github dot io tim d-a-u-b dot github dot io um how can people find you online it, what's the best mechanism is it twitter yeah it's twitter same username um yeah or on my blog there is all the contact information my email and so on great well tim thanks so much for coming on the pod thank you for for your time and giving me the chance to speak yeah thank you very much <laughs> peace tim thanks <laughs>